Okay, now with all that said, let me turn and just briefly introduce uh, Matt Richards. He's a shareholder at the firm of Curtin and McConkey, was educated at the J. Reuben Clark Law School where he was a lead note and comment editor of the BYU Law Review and graduated magna cum laude with the Order of the Coif. Uh, Matt is someone who sees beyond the ordinary pressures of legal practice and litigation and has managed to make significant contributions to thinking about megatrends in religious freedom and that's one of the reasons he is speaking to you today. In a day when many take religious freedom for granted or have forgotten its importance he leads off in sharing some of his work on why religious freedom remains our first freedom, a freedom truly foundational for just government everywhere, not only here, but abroad. He has uh, <coughs> been awarded uh, or designated as uh, one of the super lawyers in business litigation in the, in the region. He was not sure how seriously we should take that, but I think it's a fitting, uh, fitting bit of praise for him. Uh, he's uh, certainly been a super lawyer in my eyes. Uh, thanks, Matt. I hope you can hear me. I've got this. Uh mobile mic because unlike Cole, I, I don't read my text. Uh, I'm also grateful that uh, he's given you a, a nice Miranda warning about your rights, right, so that you, don't, you can avoid the camera. And, and I'm particularly grateful that he gave you a warning about civility, too. So, so hold your, your projectiles and, and, uh, and we'll have a good conversation today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you. Um, my task is really to introduce the the idea of why religious freedom is important to us and what, what matters to us. And I think to begin with, I'll ask you to pull out uh, your phone or your iPad or a piece of paper and a pencil. I'm going to ask you some questions. And just note for yourself the answers to these questions. Who are you? How do you define yourself? How do you interact with others around you? What is most important to you? These questions go to who you are as an individual. And we live in a country, I think I need to say right off the bat, that we live in a country, most of us, where we can answer those questions and our answers can be different from one another. And that's a significant benefit. There are places in the world where it's, it's harder to define ourselves in an individual way. But all of these questions go to who we are as, as individuals, to our core beliefs and our core identity. And it's from our beliefs and our identity that we do a lot of things. We say what we say based on what we believe. We associate with others. Often we choose to associate with friends or colleagues and associates, or we assemble in churches and in public institutions with people who share our ideals. Who we are dictates what we do, how we behave, how we act, and even what we like, what we shop for, what we choose to do on our spare time. All of these things come out of who we are. And in our country, we have rights that protect those aspects. So in terms of being able to say what we want to say, we have protections of free speech. We also have protections of the freedom to associate and to assemble with other people. We have free press that protects us. We have other rules like non-discrimination and a, a, a whole host of other statutes and regulations that protect us in our behaviors and in our, uh, so that we can live out our lives in a way that's meaningful in our society. So if we have all of those protections, why do we need religious freedom? And what's it for? And the simple answer to that question 
is that religious freedom protects us at our core. It protects us to be able to form and hold beliefs that are important to us, and really to protect us as individuals um, it, with our own identity. And so to state this other ways, religious freedom protects our ability to define ourselves individually and collectively with others, and then speak and act out of what we believe. If we have, if our beliefs or our identity are attacked or narrowed or constricted in any way, then these other aspects, how we manifest ourselves, how we live, those are shaken as well. Constrictions can come in a lot of ways. They can come by government regulations. Many parts of the world have uh, severe limitations on the freedom of religion or belief. A Pew study found, and I think these numbers are even escalated in a recent study, but more than 75% of the world's population live in countries where the freedom of conscience is severely limited. And that's 86% of the 143 largest countries. Restrictions on our beliefs and identity can also come from social pressures. And sometimes those are indirect, and sometimes they manifest in, in other forms of violence that are not necessarily government-sponsored or initiated. But they're just as real in terms of, of limiting our ability to define ourselves in, in the way that God dictates to our heart. I learned this when I was a seventh grader because I had a crush on a girl named Regina. And I really wanted Regina to be able to like me back. And there was about anything I would have done to force her to like me back. But what would be the consequence of my telling Regina or compelling her or pinning her up against the wall and say, you gotta like me? It doesn't work, right? Light love, beliefs can't be forced or they're not authentic. The only way we can truly identify or uh, define ourselves and our identity the way we connect with other people in a really authentic way is for us to be able to freely choose those beliefs, otherwise they're forced. The European Court of Human Rights said this about religious freedom and its importance in our society. I, and there are many other um, statements about its importance, but this is one I particularly like because it's from a body that's significant um, uh, it, it, it's, it, what, you'll, you'll see, I think, why I think it's great. In its religious dimension, religious liberty is one of the most vital elements that go to the makeup, the identity of believers and their conception of life. So it's important to people of faith. But it is also a precious asset for, those, for atheists, agnostics, skeptics, and the unconcerned. Why is it important to both religious and non-religious? The pluralism, indissociable from a democratic society, which has been dearly won over the centuries, depends on it. That's a complicated way of saying that our very democracy depends on pluralism. It depends on having a range of ideas. It depends on having not just what's politically correct, or not just traditional values, or not just your way of thinking, or my way of thinking. It depends on having a spectrum of ideas that we can draw from to form our beliefs and our identity. And it works like this. So if we go back to our, our model here, our graph, we derive our beliefs from a marketplace of ideas. So we choose from a whole range of different things. These boxes can represent your faith, our faith. It can represent different lifestyles. It can represent different philosophies. But they're all different worldviews. When we're born, we don't have, we, we have a lot to learn. We come perhaps ingrained with certain fundamental ideas and things that resonate with us. But they give voice or as we select and as we choose how we're going to define ourselves and follow, what, what truth we follow. But if society, through government regulation or through indirect social pre pressures, eliminates certain of these ideas as intolerable in some ways, then it shrinks 
our marketplace. It shrinks the universe from which we can choose and believe. And it then colors our beliefs and identity because it constrains them. If you're like me, I don't, I'm not a big shopper, but I do like to be able to have uh, choices. And so this is just an analogy here. If you're going off and you need to buy the things that you need for a day or a week or a month, it's really great to go to a supermarket because of the many choices they offer, or a mall. So here we have a strip mall. And we've got the drugstore and the Polish deli and a shoe store and, and a couple of other short stores. But if these, if these stores were closed, and we had to buy everything from the Polish deli and, and the shoe store, which looks like it's bankrupt, we wouldn't have very many choices and soon we'd all be wearing the same things or eating the same foods and life would not be very interesting. The point then is exactly what the European Court of Human Rights summarized. It's essential for us in a democracy to make sure that we have a robust and open and civil marketplace of ideas from which we can choose and then define our own identity and live out our lives in ways that are responsible and respectful of others. In other words, religious freedom is the architecture that gives many diverse groups a space to coexist. It's the essence of democracy. So fundamentally, that's why religious freedom is important. It's important for us individually to define who we are, and it's important for our society because it gives us a range of choices from which to choose and develop the best society we can. Let me just summarize with three key points. First, without religious freedom, all rights suffer. Religious freedom applies to both the religious and non-religious views. And it's essential for there to be fairness for all. You see that on the taglines for the conference uh, here, uh, the, the signage. But it's really important. It can't be selfish. It can't protect just my faith, but it needs to pr protect your faith and all faiths and no faiths. To claim it for ourselves, we need to afford it to others. And just to emphasize for, for those of us who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, this is something that, that our leaders have emphasized repeatedly recently. So in the last, since 2010, my count is that there have been at least eight conference talks directly addressing religious freedom and this concept here. To emphasize just one, in April, Elder Hales said this, religious freedom is essential to our spiritual life and our very salvation. And then he called on all of us to become engaged and he said, brothers and sisters, we are responsible to safeguard these sacred freedoms and rights for ourselves and our posterity. And that's true because in order for us to be able to, take, to, to live our life in a meaningful way, our Father in heaven and when we came to earth, gave us the great gift of agency, or in other words, the right to choose our own course. President Monson said, next to the bestowal of life itself, the right to direct that life is God's greatest gift to man. Only when we can choose from a range of options is that choice authentic. We need to have many choices in order to be able to exercise that, and so that's why he our Father in Heaven gives Satan free reign to tempt us in lots of ways. We encounter opposition so that we can choose our course. And that choice to follow God is faith. Faith is essential in order to access the Savior's gift of grace to each of us. For this reason, the brethren and uh, Elder Oaks, Elder Holland, Elder Christopherson, and Sister Marriott in a con news conference in January of this year before announcing their support for non-discrimination ordinance in, in Utah, emphasized these very points and called for fairness for all. And it really stems from 
a passage in the Doctrine and Covenants where prophetic direction dictated why Mormons care so deeply about religious freedom. That civil magistrate should restrain crime but never control conscience, should punish gift, guilt, but never suppress the freedom of the soul. That's a background, friends, of, of why religious freedom matters to us as a democracy. It also covers, I think briefly, why it matters to those of us of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and to people of all faith because the concepts are similar in many, many other teachings. And, uh, and I just want to recap some of these things with this short video. This is, the video is broken into three parts. First of all, you'll hear some, a lot of questions asking what is religious freedom, and then you'll see some, some statements from, from leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and then talks a little bit about what we can do as individuals to help promote and preserve religious freedom. freedom of religion? No opinion. Tell me. Of course I have an opinion. Religious freedom means to me that you can worship a yellow dog if that's what you so desire. You have that right as long as you're not trying to hurt other people in doing it. Religious groups decide for themselves what their followers should be doing. Freedom of religion is not freedom from religion. People want um, voices silenced that are not in agreement with theirs, but they don't want their own voice silenced. We have to respect everybody, culture, religion, opinion. If there is a more foundational issue uh, relative to this country, I don't know what it is. There is a battle over the meaning of that freedom. The contest is of eternal importance and it is your generation that must understand the issues and make the efforts to prevail. Religious freedom is the uh, right to practice your faith, to have a faith, and to manifest it publicly and in private. It's also the right to act and to interact with people of different faiths in a way that's consistent with your religious convictions. People can make it sound very persuasive that, well, as long as you can believe what you want, then the rest of it doesn't really matter. But if you can't manifest your beliefs, then they, they lose a great deal of their meaning. Freedom of conscience is the right to not be forced to do something that violates the truth that God has spoken to your heart. And so it's that freedom of conscience that undergirds this freedom of religion. I think practicing what we preach is the second priority. So not criticizing other religions, not making fun of other religions, teaching your children to respect other religions, learning about your friend's religious beliefs, and then doing something. We could go to the internet, we could uh, go to the library, we could get engaged and involved in a local interfaith organization. You feel the brotherhood and you feel the common cause from all the different people and you feel that we are all children of God. You don't have to have any special kind of training. All it takes is an interest and a willingness to speak up and be involved. In the 21st century, we cannot flee any longer. We're going to have to fight for laws and circumstances and environments that allow the free exercise of religion and our franchise in it. I'm involved in nonprofit work and I'm currently a student. A chamber board member for Leavenworth, Washington. The Interfaith uh, Council in Whatcom County, Washington. Children's Community Choir. The Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I'm part of the food pantry in our community. I'm president of the Latino Student Association at my school. On Twitter, I get on I share the things that I, I deeply care about. We don't know when or where the issue is going to come up. There's no way to anticipate that. But the Lord knows, and he's going to help us be in the position to make a difference. My challenge today is that you join with people of all faiths who feel accountable to God in defending religious freedom so it can be a beacon for morality. We caution you to be civil and responsible as you defend religious liberty and moral values. 
We ask that you do this on the internet and in your personal interactions in the neighborhoods and communities where you live. Be an active participant, not a silent observer. So hopefully that just gives an emphasis, I guess, to the conversations that we're going to be having today. We're going to have in the workshops and in the discussions that are follow me, lots more discussion about what it means to become involved and what religious freedom means to us on a practical level and what those different issues are that are emerging today, both in our own community and then even internationally. There are many issues that, that are arising. I want to begin, though, by saying that here we have a high degree of freedom. But even here in the United States and in Canada and in Western Europe, where these freedoms have been most, most uh, developed, they're under pressure. And, and so for the next few minutes, I'd like to just introduce what some of those pressures are. And uh, first of all, this graph from the Pew Forum, uh, Pew Research Center's Forum on Religion and Public Life, illustrates the trends that where they, they, what they've done is they've measured restrictions on religious freedom, both government restrictions and social restrictions. This chart has to, uh, focuses on government restrictions on religious freedom, and it measures it by region of the world. And it's beginning with the most restrictive region, the Middle East and North Africa, you'll see that they that there are significantly more restrictions there than they are in the Americas, for example, which is the lowest restriction. What this graph also shows is the, is the pattern of movement over a five-year period. So the darker line and dot is the, is the current uh, level of restriction. The lighter line and dot is just underneath that, um, that range is the restriction level, level restrictions about five years ago. So for example, with Middle East and North Africa, the current score is 5.6, but a few years ago it was 5.2, which shows that the level of restrictions, and, and this is mainly measured in terms of violence or out, uh, regulations that, that, are, that are restrictive on religious freedom, that's increasing. And the same same pattern is shown in other areas. So Europe, for example, the current score is 2.3. A few years ago, it was 1.8, which is a rather significant increase. There are some areas where it's not changing very much at all, like Asia Pacific. In America, we're seeing a slight increase as well. So the current score is 1.2. Before that, it was 1.1. So I think the main message here is that, first of all, we enjoy a significant degree of religious freedom, which we need to preserve. But we have been warned by Elder Perry, who, who said this just before he passed away, in many countries, including the United States, religious freedom is slowly and dangerously eroding. So in the spirit of wanting to uh, predict or assess what kinds of questions we are likely to face in the future, I'm going to just run through some, some scenarios and some things that we see as trends that are likely to come up. And some of these are, many of these are coming from cases that have been decided by the courts of the United States and Canada over the last little bit. And these same kinds of issues are, are showing themselves in other parts of the world too, but we're focusing mainly for our purposes today and on North America. For individuals, the first, the first question that we need to ask is, Will religious viewpoints be suppressed in the public square and other places where people live out their lives? That's a serious question, especially with the advent of other competing rights, including the, the same-sex marriage decision that was recently handed down. There is a, a serious question of whether a religious viewpoint is as welcome in the public square as um, a, a, a viewpoint that's contrary to that and, and in favor of, uh, of same-sex relationships for, for, as one example among many. Another question to we ask is parents teaching children. Will parents of school children be able to ensure that their religious values aren't undermined through classroom instruction or intimidation? 
There have been cases where schools curriculum or school teachers are instructed to present, uh, to teach our children in ways that parents may find problematic. Can parents have a voice in that instruction? The workplace. Will employees be able to maintain their religious identity in the workplace and be reasonably accommodated when work and religious duties conflict? You may be aware of a United States Supreme Court decision that was uh, handed down just recently involving this young woman um, who applied to work at Abercrombie and & Fitch and was rejected because she wore a headscarf. The court ruled that she was entitled to be able to work uh, there, but the question remains here in this country and, es and especially in other countries whether people can manifest their religious beliefs in their clothing and uh, especially if they're employed by the government. Uh, that's also a big question about Saturday or uh, Sunday working rules for people who have uh, a day of worship. Professional credentials. And this is something that's, uh, there are actually a number of cases on this topic. Will professionals lose or be denied licensing for expressing religious views or declining to provide services that are available elsewhere but that are at odds with their belief? So for example, this is the pharmacist who d declines to dispense abortion-inducing drugs. Or the physician who declines to uh, artificial insemination in a, in a uh, same-sex marriage couple. Or a, um, a, a sociology student studying social work uh, who is denied or, or kicked out of her professional program because she doesn't want to counsel people of alternative lifestyles that it's, it's an acceptable way of life. These are actual cases and we need to confront this issue as a society. Will family and religiously oriented businesses be able to maintain their values in the face of anti-discrimination laws? You're aware of the Hobby Lobby decision by the United States Supreme Court, where Hobby Lobby declined to provide, uh, to, to pay for contraceptives as part of its employee benefit plan for, for its employees because that violated the religious beliefs of the, of the owners of this, of Hobby Lobby, a family owned business, um, whose evangelical teachings uh, c concluded that that was inconsistent and, and they wouldn't do that. The Supreme Court upheld Hobby Lobby's ability to, to decline to provide those benefits to their employees. College campuses. Will campus students groups be able to select their own leaders and express religious method, message? This comes out of a case uh, from a couple of years ago involving the Christian Legal Society at the University of, Col uh, of California Hastings where the Christian Legal Society required its, its student members to sign a, a pledge, an, an honor code of sorts, that to belong to the club, you need to affirm a particular, uh, um, a, a chaste lifestyle. And the college said uh, that, that that was inappropriate and banned the, the club from campus. They sued and it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, ruled actually in favor of the college and said that the college could adopt an all comers policy <laughs> which meant that anyone could participate in any club and not be excluded. As a result of that, many Christian or faith-based clubs have been excluded from comp campuses and universities that adopted a similar all-comers policy, including pictured here Vanderbilt University, for example. We, con we confront that from, in our church with the LDS Student Association. Freedom from retaliation. Will those who voice beliefs be retaliated against? This is a picture of the former CEO of Mozilla. You may have heard about him in the news. His brief tenure of the C, uh, as CEO of Mozilla was, uh, was cut short because it was disclosed that he contributed to Prop 8 in California and he was summarily terminated. Questions for religious organizations are similar. 
Will churches continue to have the right to employ people that affirm and live the church's belief? Will they be forced to provide employment benefits that contradict their beliefs? We'll hear later about the Hosanna Tabor case in which um, a, a religious-based school terminated the employment of a minister teacher. That case went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled that the school was able to decide whether to employ a minister because the minister is the lifeblood of the church and dictating who teaches the, the, the doctrine or the beliefs of the school then of the church dictates the, the church and colors those things. You know, so that was a good outcome, a fantastic outcome for, for religious liberty. Private property. Will churches be able to build and maintain houses of worship and other facilities? Will they be able to preserve their religiously important properties for activities that are consistent with religious beliefs? Religious uh, institutions have a hard time around the country building and maintaining uh, their chapels because local land use boards often make those decisions based on local politics or aesthetic criteria which may or may not be welcoming to churches. Also, ta uh, churches use of the, the tax exemptions have been eliminated for churches who use property um, in, a, in what are perceived to be discriminatory ways. And then the tax exempt, tax exempt status of religious organizations themselves. Will churches and schools that affirm the traditional definition of marriage lose their tax exempt status? Will donors' contributions be tax deductible? This is a, a real question that's being posed today. Will religious organizations be able to participate on equal terms with other nonprofit organizations in government programs and the use of government facilities and properties? And then finally, will religious schools be able to maintain their religious values and standards while also retaining their accreditation and the ability to participate in federal educational and research grants? There's a, a, just as an example of this, the Obama administration recently ex extended an executive order that's been on the books for a number of decades that says that anyone who enters a federal contract or receives money from the government has to agree to non-discrimination policies as a condition to receiving the benefits of, that, of the financial grant or contract which is a significant source of research dollars for universities, for example. Let me just add one that's not, that's not on the slide, but that's just uh, the obvious point that will communities be able to, um, to, to have public celebrations of religious holidays? So prayer at the beginning of a legislative session or statements of in God we trust. Currently those things are, dis are, are allowed under the theory that they no longer have any religious meaning. But the question is, will, will continue to percolate of whether those things are allowed. I just want to conclude going back to, some, if, to Elder Hale's conference talk from April 2015 and his invitation for all of us to become involved. He said, don't walk, run run to receive the blessings of agency by following the Holy Ghost and exercising freedoms God has given to us to do His will. And specifically he said, become involved, join with others, work side by side to protect religious freedom, and above all be examples of the believer. And um, I think we have a little bit of time for questions if, if, if I'm not right. So if you have any questions, in fact we have one up here. We have the microphones here. So we'll send mics up. We uh, so just hold for a second while the mic gets to you. Two mics. Uh, 
I'm interested in how we, well, I guess I have a concern with the marketplace of ideas sort of justification for religious freedom, which seems to lend itself towards uh, a kind of relativism of ideas. If we see religious freedom and democracy as ideas within this marketplace that clearly we believe you know, societies probably preferably should select, I mean, how do we explain that there are, in fact, some ideas and values that are just better than others, or at least preferable, or that our society has chosen to advance that, you know, therefore cause us to want to eliminate incompatible or threatening ideas within this marketplace? I think that's a great question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Uh, good question. What is the marketplace and are there limits to it? And of course, there, uh, you know, we have a long tradition, and every society has a tradition that, that uh, is built in some ways on certain ideals and, and culture. And that's, uh, that's an important part of the heritage of, that, of the community. So the reality, though, is that the world is becoming increasingly flat. And so it's, it's a luxury that we, we don't have as much today as we did 50 or 100 years ago, where, where the culture was pretty homogenous. And so you have lots of different ideas that are being presented. And you, you have people of, of different races, different cultures, different religious ideals. And, and questions of what's better are, are difficult for a society to answer. Because if we start to make value judgments based on what the best is, then, then that can be a fickle judgment that can be, that can be um, skewed by changing political landscapes. And, and soon, if, if we're, we're cutting out certain views because we don't like them, then actually the reality is we might be next. So, so why is religious freedom better than theocracy? Or, I mean, like, that's what I, this is my conflict, is like, okay, this is, I mean, so pluralism itself is an idea within a marketplace of ideas. I mean, do you understand my? Yeah, let, let, me, let me take a shot at this. <coughs> um, fundamental problem here is that there are multiple ideas, and the question is whose ideas get empowered? Uh, the, there is a strong risk that if you authorize government institutions to back one idea or another, they will choose the wrong one. Uh, I think that's, there's just an incredibly high likelihood of that. I, I think one of the other things I would say, though, from practical experience, I, I think I, I, as a law student, I didn't necessarily understand this, but I've spent a lot of time in public hearings, in public settings. Um, and one of the realities is, if you listen to people, the ideas that come out are better than what you start with. I don't know that they're, that we have uh, pure access to the very to the very best. It's, I, it may be part of life in the mortal situ situation. But I think one of the reasons religious freedom is so important is that it protects not only the possibility of it protects not only different ideas, but it protects the seedbed institutions that make it possible to frame ideas and to frame uh, uh, better visions. People are going to have freedom to choose uh, what, what the different outcomes will be. But I think the experience of the last 200 years was that the American experiment was right, that you, you come closer to something really good if you protect people's rights to freedom of religion or belief. This is, not a, this is not a commitment to relativism. It's a commitment that different people, it is a recognition that different people will see truth differently. And that that capacity to seek and strive after truth is vital and that we are all better off if we let people follow that uh, their promptings of conscience as they see it. So there's a question right uh, in front of the prior person. I think just building on um, what he was just saying, I, I think to continue that out, and I, I have a further question on that is, um, 
so what do you do with a philosophy then like, uh, for instance, communism, um, which would not, so if that's in the marketplace, and it is, um, but if it were in power, um, eliminates other possibilities in the marketplace. Um, and therefore, I think possibly in a situation like we have in America would not be considered an equal ideal or one that we would necessarily want to um, see rise up and have a lot of power um, because that runs counter to religious freedom and it runs counter to um, a financial free marketplace. Um, so how do you, you know, in protecting these different ideas, obviously not all of them are equal in that they won't respect the equality of other ideas. Um, this is a classic problem in liberal theory because it was recognized by Locke, it comes down to the present. Uh, one of the ways it's been characterized is the problem of militant democracy. So what do you do when you have a Hitler who is going to come in and use elections one time to abolish elections? It's a, it's a problem all over the Middle East. Uh, there, there have to be some limits on what, what's, you know, what's permissible. Uh, but what we have found, I mean, at the time of Locke, he thought, well, you should, you should tolerate all but the intolerant. But the intolerant, in his view, included Catholics, atheists, probably Muslims, and maybe Jews. This left only Protestants. <laughs> uh, I think the basic principle is right that there have to be some limits, but we have learned through experience that the, the limits can be fairly broad. And, uh, if you have open discourse, if you have a free society, uh, the more extreme views tend to be self-defeating. I've spent much of the last weekend working on a draft law in Vietnam where you see the opposite. And it's, it's clear that if you have a, a government that is committed to controlling every aspect of religious life, you will have problems. Uh, so I think it's vital that we fight for these things. There are, there are going to be limits, but my sense is one of the wonderful things about American society is we can have fairly robust limits. But it depends on having all kinds of inputs and, and not some of the more valuable inputs not quieting themselves and engaging in self-censorship. That's part of the reason it's so important to have a lot of people finding effective ways to in, in, to, to encourage what they think is best. If we lose that striving, if we lose a lot of people striving, if people become apathetic, uh, then you have no positive inputs going into the system and the negative inputs can overwhelm. I just want to agree 100% with that. And it's really that all of this is trying to feed into a democracy, right? A democracy is the best scenario for, for allowing there to be that dialogue, the compromises that come out of it, that, that benefit for society. And so as long as we preserve that democracy, then it works. If there are, like communism or something that comes in and, and gains steam and limits it, then you're right back to the point of, of cutting away how we define ourselves through our beliefs and our individuality. Thank you. Um, on a perhaps more practical side, the recent Supreme Court decision has raised a number of is questions uh, as to f the extension of services and rights or the use of a, a facility for um, a, a, an act or practice that one disagrees with philosophically or religiously. What are the current limits or your perception of the current limits on whether someone can or should uh, decline to provide services, decline to provide a, um, a facility and object to a certain kind of activity in, in, the, mar in the marketplace? That's a great question and I think there are going to be whole sessions devoted to that question today and tomorrow and Wednesday. So, I, so uh, in some ways I want to defer some of that to, to those discussions because they'll, it, it's, the question is really nuanced right now. It's a, it's a shifting sands and, uh, and a lot of those questions are not resolved uh, but questions of whether a religion can save its 
use its property only for things that are religiously important or consistent with its belief, for example, those are, the current law is that it can do that, uh, but if it opens up a, a facility like a wedding chapel for others and then discriminates, then it puts itself in a problem. So if it uses it only for its own use, then it's a lot more secure than, for example, if it if it operates as a nonprofit business or a commercial business, and then and then it's restricted to other people. So that's that gives you an ex an example of, of one of the lines that, that can be drawn. And the same on a personal sphere as a professional um, declining to provide services to some. Those are those are sometimes dictated by state law. Some states have laws against discrimination that apply to private businesses. And so it really depends on the law of the state where you live in practice of whether that, that's covered or not covered. This is obviously a complicated question because we have the public, public accommodation rules coming from uh, racial civil rights issues in the background. And uh, I think that the challenge here really going ahead, and this is one of the things we're thinking about, is how does one articulate some lines? Because this, by the way, is one of the areas that was not part of the Utah Compromise. And it wasn't in, in part because it was difficult. Uh, and there's, uh, there agreement could be reached in some other areas, but there are harder, harder cases here. I think uh, one kind of, part of it is, it, there is a sense that if people enter into commerce, uh, they shouldn't be uh, engaging in discrimination. On the other hand, the mere fact that you open a business does not mean you have to give up your rights of conscience. I, I worry a lot that uh, we've, we've had a world in which uh, people have been increasingly argue, arguing that religion should ch check its uh, religious beliefs at the door and entering into the public arena in the political sphere. If we're also asked to check our religious beliefs when we enter into the commercial sphere, that's a big problem. But uh, at the same time, uh, people have a right not to be discriminated against. And, uh, and so how to just sort this out. I, I, one of the things I've been intrigued by is the argument that in some of these cases, if you've got an expressive, uh, if you've got an expressive right, and that this might address the, the wedding cake cases, the photography cases, the professional professional cases, uh, then there's a stronger interest in in having an exemption from normal public accommodation rules. Uh, but the, as, as Matt says, these are cases that are very much being litigated. Uh, a lot of them have, have been lost recently. And I think uh, much more thought uh, is needed. Yeah, there is, you know, just uh, can, can, you, can you wait for that? It's my understanding, and I could be wrong, that BYU not too long ago denied um, exemptions uh, to its beard pol to its no beard policy based on religious grounds. Um, how do you feel about if I'm correct? Uh, did you agree with that position, or how do you feel about that? How does that relate to what we're addressing here in terms of affording others? Uh, their right to practice their religion uh, when we demand that right. And uh, it appears in that case that maybe the why made a mistake. Do you agree or not? I, I have to admit, I travel too much, so I don't know what actually happened. I have the, does somebody know? I, I have the sense that that one got overturned, but does anyone know? I know. Yeah. Historically, there have been three exceptions to the no uh, beard policy. One is for uh, theatrical and also for health, and then uh, and from time to time for other religions. And that, for, that policy was made formal, I think, January or February of 2015. So that, in effect, overruled whatever that other decision was, right? Or, no, or, there, there's, there's a formal policy where there's a procedure where you can wear a beard and you fall within one of those three exceptions. So I'm glad I can agree with that policy. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, one of those exemptions now is faith-based um, beliefs. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oops, let's see. I'm going to bring it down here. Down here. <laughs> In the recent discussions for the Supreme Court decision, I believe that Judge Alito asked the U.S. Attorney whether um, this decision to legalize gay marriage would affect religious universities. And the answer from the, the U.S. Attorney was a resounding, yes, it will affect religious universities. What do you see happening and what challenges are we going to face? I am aware of a case in Canada where a law school may be or is deni denied accreditation um, based on their religious standards. Well, I think this is, a, this is certainly a, a, a big risk and a big issue. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure whether the Alito colloquy was about education or tax exempt status, but uh, it could be the, the same issue for both. I, I think it will, it will, one of the issues is going to be how this spreads out into areas where you have not just the, the church itself, but religiously affiliated organizations that may be very much bound by the same conscientious constraints uh, and, and yet will come up against these anti-discrimination rules on the other side. As, as someone pointed out, uh, one of the difficulties is that a, a court that can uh, sort of significantly broaden the way substantive due process is applied can also reshape religious liberty norms, especially since the, there have always been exceptions to religious liberty norms and compelling or fundamental interests have an easier time overriding. So, so I mean, this is, this is the drama that lies ahead. On the, uh, on the Trinity Western case, the Canadian case, there, there has been one court that has decided in their favor. There was a decision last week that in, in Ottawa, in, in the big, big, in Ontario. Ontario, the biggest province that they lost. There have been one or two others that they've lost. The issue is because they have an honor code, very much like BYU's, the idea is that uh, they are training people uh, to believe in discrimination and therefore they should not even be eligible to take bar exams or to be considered for the bar. Therefore, I mean, they can have a law school, but it will not be accredited, will not be able to function. Uh, and I think this is a really severe problem. I was on our faculty when we were going through this accreditation issue here. Fortunately uh, for us and for many other religiously affiliated law schools and universities in general, uh, the tradition of religiously affiliated ed education in our country was strong. It's not strong in Canada. And Trinity Western, I was with the dean a week ago, uh, they're very much, they're very worried. I'll just add that it's the position of the Obama administration that there ought not to be um, exceptions to non-discrimination rules for, for religious affiliated universities and for other organizations that of conscience. And that we saw that play out in Hosanna Tabor, we saw that play out in other cases. That's not something that's been decided. So this same-sex marriage decision does not speak to that issue. Um, and in fact, the court came out the other way in, in the Hosanna Tabor case. So, so that's something that's yet to be decided. But it's very much um, where the Obama administration is, is, is headed. Well, we're, we're out of time. Uh, there will be many opportunities for more questions. We have one of these impossibly short 15-minute breaks, have intense discussions with someone next door for two or three minutes, and get back here, and we'll start at 10.30.